Now let's talk about the FAA's rules for the operation of drones. You'll need to know these rules to pass your FAA knowledge test, but more than that, the rules give you a good set of risk management procedures. As a result, knowing them will provide you a couple of other benefits. First, you'll be able to fly drones safely. Plus, if you follow these rules, you won't interfere with manned aircraft. The FAA refers to that concept as integrating safely into the National Airspace System. For short, they call that the NAS. And it will keep you out of trouble, which is a very good thing. Now, the FAA regulations are under Title 14 of the Code of Federal Regulations. Now, that's the way the FAA refers to their own regulations. So if you see a reference to Title 14, don't let that confuse you. It's just a formal way of referring to the FAA regulations. Now, the FAA regulations are broken down into different parts, depending on what they cover. For instance, drones operated strictly for hobby or recreational purposes are under Rule uh, 44809. And that's for recreation operations only, and it has to do strictly with regulations. But if you use a drone for anything other than a hobby or recreation, like a business, such as shooting video or photographs, you're under Part 107 of the regulations. Now, you'll want to know that any form of compensation for flying a drone puts you under Part 107. It's not just being paid cash. The FAA considers goodwill or other non-monetary value as compensation. That would include things like volunteering to use your drone on behalf of a not-for-profit organization. On the other hand, recreational flight is simply flying for fun or personal enjoyment. Now, that looks like fun. On the other hand, for public operations, they have the operation, that's, that's a state or federal agency, has the operation of operating by either 107 or making a choice to operate under what they call a certificate of authorization. It's called a COA uh, or a COA, they call it. So they have the choice if they're a federal or a state agency. Notice it's what you do with a drone that determines which set of rules apply to you, not the type or the weight of the drone. However, for each set of rules, there is a maximum weight. For recreational purposes, which is governed by 44809, the maximum weight of the drone, including everything attached to it, can be 55 pounds. Under Part 107, uh, notice the maximum weight, including everything attached to it, can, must be less than 55 pounds. Now, notice that 44809, it can actually weigh 55 pounds. Under 107, it's less than 55 pounds. That's just a little inconsistency in the regulations. Now, the rules for recreational use of drones are pretty simple. First, you need to pass a computer-based test called TRUST, and TRUST stands for the Recreational UAS Safety Test, and you correct the TRUST test to 100% on your own, and what you need to do is carry proof that you pass the test in case the FAA or law enforcement happens to ask you for it. Now, you can find out more about TRUST by going to trust.modelaircraft.org. Now, if your drone weighs more than 0.55 pounds, you'll register your drone through the FAA's drone zone. Uh, notice that is 0.55 pounds. In that case, you'll need to mark your drone on the outside with a registration number and carry proof of the registration with you. You'll also need to follow the safety guidelines published in the current version of the Advisory Circular 9157 or in accordance with the FAA, the FAA recognized community-based organization. Uh, the FAA likes to refer to them as a CBO and, and, and I'm not sure what that means exactly, but basically the FAA wants you to, to fly in accordance with the rules of the Academy of Model Aeronautics, known as the AMA. And the Academy of Model Aeronautics has been regulating model aircraft for many, many years. It's been self-regulating it. Now, here are some basic operational rules that you'll need to follow for recreational drone use. First of all, give way and do not interfere with manned aircraft. Keep your drone within visual line of sight or use a visual observer who is in direct physical communication with you. Fly at or below 400 feet above ground level and in operations in controlled airspace, for that, 
obtain authorization by using LANCE, which you can learn to do for free in a course from King Schools. And do not operate your drone in a dangerous manner. For example, do not interfere with emergency response like firefighting operations or law enforcement activities. And do not fly under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Now, individuals violating any of these rules or operating in, in a dangerous manner may be subject to a bunch of trouble with the FAA or law enforcement. And that pretty much wraps up these rules for recreational use of drones. Now, if you're under Part 107 of the regulations, that is more complicated, as you well know. Now let's talk about some definitions. First of all, an unmanned aerial vehicle or a drone is an aircraft where there's no possibility of intervention from someone on board the aircraft. I'd like to see you try and climb on board that aircraft. Well, the FAA tends to look at the operation of a drone as a complete system, including everything needed for the operation. That's why it's called an SUAS, a Small Unmanned Aircraft System. And the system can include, for instance, the vehicle itself, uh, uh, the small unmanned aerial vehicle. It can include the, the control station and the links and the crew. Now, the crew can consist of just one crew member, starting with you, the PIC or pilot in command, or it can have multiple crew members. And regardless of how many people there are in the crew, you, the PIC, are directly responsible for and the final authority over the operation of the flight and of the safety of the flight, including everything involved in it. Now, other crew members can include a separate person manipulating the control Controls. And that person, by the way, would not have to have a remote pilot certificate. But the person manipulating the controls operates the SUAS under the direct supervision of the remote pilot in command. And the crew can also include a visual observer, sometimes called a VO. The visual observer helps you see and avoid other air traffic and other objects in the air and on the ground. And when you do have several crew members, it's important that you designate in advance who the PIC is. There might be even more than one PIC, and you can transfer back and forth who the PIC is, but you have to know exactly who the PIC is at any given moment. Plus, when you're transferring the designation back and forth, you must maintain visual line of sight with the aircraft and be able to make that transfer without loss of control. Now, as you might guess, the FAA is very concerned about the number of drone pilots that are going to be out there in the future. They are huge numbers. And so they're very concerned about keeping control of all this. And to do that, they rely on information that you give them when they authorize operations and determine compliance. If you fraudulently or knowingly provide false records or alter records, they may take action against you. If they think they, that you have given them false information, they can take action against you as an owner, or an operator, a remote PIC, in fact, anyone they think is guilty. Now, action could include civil sanctions, uh, denial of uh, future applications, or suspension or revocation of a pilot certificate or a certificate of waiver. It's serious stuff. They don't want you lying to them.